Uh, give you a little half hour presentation on the structure inventories, developing a structure inventory, a better understanding of what it is and what we're trying to achieve for a consequence assessment. I'm going to talk to you about so, uh, what a structure inventory is, um, introduce the national structure inventory, the latest version, version 2.0, that's out there and what went into building it, some of the data sources, how it was developed, uh, discuss some of the improvements that were made, uh, review future improvements to that natural structure inventory, and then uh, define some of the common errors. The goal with talking about the national structure inventory is that it first will provide you a sense of what we use in the core for our consequence assessments, um, and then also hopefully spur some ideas on how you could develop a structure inventory if you have to develop one from scratch. All right, so just go through the process a little bit. Step one, uh, you need to gather your data. That's the, that's the hard part, right, as we discussed, unless you have a ready-to-go data set. Um, but even then, there's issues that we'll talk about. You need to develop your inventory, set your values and your population. Once you've done that, you need to apply your hazard to that, to that structure inventory, right, to get in a sense of what the depths are, what the damages, what the life loss could be. And that's your consequence assessment piece. That's just the general, very quick and dirty process. Obviously, you could spend months and months on each piece of that, but that's the overview, overall process. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the attributes of the structures. What attributes do we find important in a structure inventory? Part of that, the first step, is what, do, what are we looking at? When we go and do our study, our assessment, how do we know um, what structures we want to grab? You need to have a sense of what your study area is right up front. A uh, little hint, if you've been asked to do a structure inventory for a study and you have a maximum inundation area in a polygon form saying, I want all structures within this polygon, buffer that polygon because guaranteed at some point within that study, the hydraulic engineers or the study teams are going to come back and say, you know what, we made a small mistake or we've reanalyzed it and our, our flows have increased and our inundation areas increased and now all of a sudden you have to go back in and find and figure out all this little band area around the edges. So do yourself a favor, buffer your structure inventory, buffer that polygon so you get enough area that you don't have to go back. Next thing is, uh, is that scalability. Jason was touching on scalability earlier. The scalability of your level of effort is really important. Are you just looking at getting a sense of what the population at risk is? If that's the case, you probably don't, you may not have to go past looking at census block data, right? You just look at census blocks, what census blocks are being inundated, what's the population in those census blocks. However, if you want to start looking at damages, you have to get a little bit more detailed. And so you scale your level of effort on your structure inventory to the level of effort of the study. If you have to do life loss, you need population. If you're not doing life loss, you don't need population. So don't go through the extra level of effort if you don't have to. All right, what describes a structure? This structure I, I really like. Um, it's the, the Kachski pillar. I, I forget exactly. I think it's in Czechoslovakia. I'm not 100% sure on that. It's in Eastern Europe. Um, really interesting uh, guy decided to build a house up there. He obviously really doesn't like people. <laughs> um, so I thought that was interesting, but I think this is a good example to go. So what describes a structure? Location, no one said location. That's a pretty big one. <laughs> if you don't have the structure's location, you're going to have a hard time doing a consequence assessment on it. Number of stories, foundation height, occupancy type. Um, I'll stick on, is anyone in here not familiar with the term occupancy type? when you're talking about structure inventory and all the, what that means. I'll go over it anyway, um, and I'll go over it in more detail in more slides, but the occupancy type generally is a way to aggregate common features of structures. So you don't have to define these common features for every single structure in your inventory. You can say, you know what, this structure is a single family residential structure, and all single family residential structures are gonna have these similar attributes and so you can aggregate it in. It's a way to, to make it simpler to, to identify what type of structure you're looking at and things like depth damage functions. Contru construction type, when you're, is it a wood framed construction? Is it attached to the foundation? Is it not attached? Is it steel? Is it, is it brick? So all these matter and there's been studies that have looked at um, the survivability of those different building types in floodwaters. Stephanie's gonna talk about that in a little bit. Population, so not only do we want to know population, but a lot of times we want to know population by time of day, right? So, and, and weekends. So we want to know how that population is changing by time, right? 
So we want to know if a, if a flood happens on the weekend, is there going to be a large event? If you have an event center in your inundation area, is there going to be a lot of people there? Things you need to know. Value, uh, the value of the structure. The, and when I'm talking about value, generally we're looking at the depreciated replacement value. How much is it going to cost to replace that structure if it, if it is damaged? All right, I want to focus on occupancy types. I think everything else is pretty self-explanatory. Um, number of stories, that's hard to confuse that one, foundation height. Uh, but occupancy types is a little bit more nuanced. There's a little bit more going on there. Um, so like I said before, it's just a way that you can aggregate common structure um, attributes, such as single family residential and so on. Uh, we have these common occupancy types that we've gotten from the Hazus MH database. Uh, and I'll just move past that. It's just a general common um, occupancy types that we use. Some of the uh, features, foundation height uncertainty. You have, you've gone through and you identified, you know what, we have a whole bunch of single family residential homes and they vary in foundation height. But you don't want to have to go in and enter the foundation height. You don't want to go out and, and do a survey on every single structure, right? You would, that would be really expensive. Instead, maybe you want to spot check a few structures and generate a distribution of uncertainty about your foundation heights. You can enter that in at the occupancy type level to allow that variation. That way you only have to do it one time and then it applies to all structures of that occupancy type. Same with structure value, right? Not every home is the exact same value. There's, every home has a different value pretty much, right? So you can identify you know what, I know what, I can identify the uncertainty about my structure value at my occupancy type. That way I don't have to know the, the exact value of every structure at every single structure. Again, it's a way to make your life a lot easier and so you don't have to go through and do this massive survey effort. Survey efforts are expensive. It costs more to do the massive survey effort than to uh, do pretty much anything else in the study probably. All right, uh, depth damage functions. This is the big one. This is the big, this is how we do it in the core. This is how I've always seen it done is that you have your occupancy type and then for all structures within that occupancy type, they use the same depth damage function. And if you have a structure that you have identified that uses a different depth damage function for structure value, content values, and so on, then you would create a new occupancy type for that structure. Evacuation parameters. This is a really cool one because when you think about it, how are people going to respond? If, if there was a warning that came through loudspeakers right now at this hotel or somebody ran in the door and said, Folsom Dam just broke. You guys need to evacuate now. We all received that warning at the same time, right? We all heard that message. We all are not going to necessarily evacuate together at the same time though, right? So the, the occupancy type we're in right now is hotel. And the way that we respond to warnings is going to be different if we're here versus at home, right? If you're at home with your family and you hear a warning, you're all going to mobilize together as a group, right? So how people react to um, an uh, evacuation order depends on where they're at, okay? Another example is a, is a multifamily structure, an apartment building. The warnings, and, the warnings will be received at slightly different times at the different domiciles, but, and they'll all evacuate at different times as well, right? Um, that's another example of where, how the occupancy type can dictate how people will receive warnings and react to those warnings. Another one is um, how likely are people gonna be able to vertically evacuate, right? Right now, we can, we can all vertically evacuate. Would we be able to get to the elevators or the stairs in time? Do we all know where the stairs are if we need to go vertical, right? So the, the structure that you're in can dictate how, how your vertical evacuation potential. Um, if I'm in a Target, for example, shopping, and all of a sudden there's a flood coming and I didn't have any warning, I'm not gonna be able to vertically evacuate because I don't know how to get on top of a Target roof. Make sense, right? However, if I'm in my home, I'm gonna be able to get up into my attic or roof. Uh, just a couple others real quick, um, looking at the, the evacuating group size. So if it's a school, if it's the occupancy type is, is educational, then you're likely that you could potentially have evacuation groups of like 30 people, it, it buses, right? Prisons, buses, um, single family residentials, you have cars, you can have, have one, maybe two cars, maybe, they, maybe the family wants to bring two cars. So how people evacuate, the, the size of the groups evacuating away from these structures, can be dictated by the occupancy type. 
submergence criteria, how um, at the occupancy type level, like if I, again, if we're in this room and water's in here already and we can't evacuate, um, I'm not going to be able to get so my head's right up near the roof. My, my, vertical, my uh, submergence is going to be different. I can climb on this table, I can get up kind of higher, but I can't necessarily get up as high as I might be able to if I'm at home. So that submergence, that depth of water to where I become in a high hazard situation can be dictated by the type of structure that you're in. Um, all right, so those are the, the structure attributes kind of I wanted to go over, occupancy types, some of the important parameters that we look at when we're thinking about occupancy types. Uh, now I want to talk about some of the common structure data sources when we're looking to develop a structure inventory. Uh, parcel data. Parcel data is the best you can get. It's a, generally, it's going to have your, um, your parcel polygons that, have, that define where your structures are located. You're going to generally get good attributes with that structure inventory. You're going to get good location information. But some things that we've run across in the past, some pitfalls that I've seen, is that it can often lack important details such as population, occupancy types, number of stories, certain structure attributes that are really important for doing a consequence assessment uh, could be missing. So maybe you only have structure location. At that point, you have to go to other data sources. Census data. Census data is great for population, right? It's the, the opposite of the parcel inventory. I have great population data, but I don't really, all I know is generally where these people are within census blocks. I don't know specifically where there are, which structures they're in, and so on. And so that's another, re, another area where you need more information to build that structure inventory. So you've got to marry those data sources together in some way, in a reasonable way, to, to develop your structure inventory. FEMA's, FEMA's has this MH database. It's great. It has population data. It has number of structures per census block. Where it lacks is that it doesn't, that those structure location information is dictated by the census blocks, right? So if you have a large census block that says 30 structures are in there, you don't know if they're all up in one corner where they wouldn't get wet at all or if they're spread evenly throughout. And then the National Structure Inventory. That's what I'm going to be talking about in a lot of detail. So in the core, um, Starting way back in the dinosaur age when Jason was leading FIA, um, there was, they would, this was a big challenge. There was no data sources like the National Structure Inventory available, so they had to develop ways, how do we create a point structure inventory from data that we currently have, because that didn't exist. So they developed several tools, several import options to import data from census, from Hazus MH, and it, it actually created the structure inventory for you by marrying all these data sources together. So if there's, a, if there's a census block with 30 structures in it, it's going to randomly place 30 structures in there and then plot people in those structures based off of their occupancy type. Since then, we've, we've built up on this, on this process that we've created and developed a process to create this process for the entire nation using various data sets. We have that on server in the core so that we can, our consequence assessors can get their study area, buffer it, and then go to the server and pull structures with all the attributes that they already need. Population, building types, number of stories, all that good stuff is ready to go right out of the box. It's not perfect, but it's a great starting point. And as you know, when you've done structure inventories on your own from scratch, that starting point's pretty rough. All right, so I'm going to talk about the National Structure Inventory 2.0. I guess probably three, four years now. The original National Structure Inventory was based off of Hazus MH census data. Structure location, there were certain faults to it. You know, first time you ever develop a, a database, there's going to be certain issues. Um, you learn from those, you improve upon it. That's what I'm going to talk about now. So the improvements on National Structure Inventory were structure location, number of stories, population distribution, and so on. Some of the data sources that were used, ESRI has a, a national data set of commercial and industrial structures uh, with population counts. And these structures are placed exactly where the locations of those structures are in space. So we use that for uh, non-residential structures, including uh, hospitals and uh, um, hotels and prisons. Uh, Core Logic, this is the data set that I said um, is the reason why it can't be shared freely. The CoreLogic data, data set has um, residential structures, point on structure, with a lot of information about those structures, occupancy type, building materials, and so on. So another really great data set. NCES is a great data set to, for schools, um, 12, 12 through, sorry, K through 12. And it gives a location, occupancy type, teacher counts, student counts, and so on. 
And I'm just going to go through all these. Microsoft, I don't know if is everyone aware of the Microsoft Building Footprint Database? Uh, so Microsoft released this data set to the world where they used all their aerial imagery to uh, an AI to develop polygon outlines of structures all around the world. Uh, and we use that in lieu of where Esri, CoreLogic, and, and CES, where these data sets fail, we can fall back to Microsoft Building Footprints for better structure placement. Uh, population data, LEHD is an excellent data set um, that's a uh, government data set that has worker counts by residential location um, and working census block. Yeah. Um, yeah, I always, longitudinal employee household dynamics or something like that. Longitudinal employee household D something. <laughs> I don't know the last word, but I'm amazed I even got the first three. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a data set that has inf a bunch of information on where people work and where they come from to get to work. So it has where they live, the census block they live, and the census block they go to to work. Really great information when we're talking about population change by time of day. Really great information. Census data for a residential, and then FEMA has this uh, for other information. Uh, like I said, it used a layered composite approach. You start with the best data available. That's the Esri and Core Logic. But that's not nationwide perfect coverage. So where those were lacking information, uh, these other data sets came in to supplement. So the building footprints, uh, has this MH data, and so on. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how those attributes were created, were generated. And hopefully this will maybe give, it, give a few light bulbs out there on, oh, if I have to build it from scratch, this would be a great starting point. Um, so it uses both parcel and Microsoft building footprint. Uh, the core in the parcels create the structure type based on placement, uh, but then we have these building footprints, right? So how do we do that? When we know that in this area there's three commercial structures and the building footprints tell us there's actually two structures, how do we place those? So the process there is looking at the area of the polygon to identify which structures should go where. So if in this case you saw one structure go to the small building up on the northern end, and the other two go in the bottom where there's the much larger structure. So it's trying to be a little bit smart about structure placement. Uh, in this example, both all two commercial structures will go to that one point. So in the National Structure Inventory, you will find stacked structures. So what that means is you'll have a point, like eight points on top of each other. And oftentimes, you'll see that in places where you have mixed commercial residential usage. So in, for example, if you have an apartment building for stories two and up, and on the first story you have, you have commercial structures. You have multiple occupancy types, multiple structure types in that location, but they're all different uses. So those will be different point, all different points, but on the same location. All right, going through these examples, um, if you have two structures and three, you know there's three in there, it's just going to find the ones with the highest area, and, and so on. So that's a big difference between 1.0 and 2.0. In 1.0, the data sources we had were Hazus MH, which is census block based. So in that case, you, you know, okay, within this census block, I have 20 structures. It was just randomly placing them because we don't have better information. We didn't have Microsoft building footprints at the time. So you can see from the image that the uh, NSI 1.0 distribution, the building locations are pretty poor, whereas NSI 2.0 is doing a much better job. Why that's important is because, as you can see here, you see a bunch of structures in the middle of a golf course, right? Low-lying areas. These low-lying areas are going to see have, uh, deeper depths. So it's going to be um, over-inflating the consequences at these locations because of the high depths in those spots. Another example, you can see a floodway just north of this uh, housing development. In the old version, it would have put structures directly in that floodway, which is bad news, right? Then you're, then you're saying the, these structures are getting damages and life losses occurring in places where people aren't even existing. There aren't even structures there. So structure placement, hugely important in, in your consequence assessment. I cannot uh, emphasize that enough. All right, uh, there is also big improvements on the number of stories. Number of stories is hard. Most a lot of databases don't have that. But when you're doing a life loss assessment, the number of stories is incredibly important, right? That vertical potential, vertical evacuation potential is, is very, very important stuff. So having an accurate number of stories can make a really big difference on your estimate of consequences. 
there are huge improvements on the number of stories. Again, it's still not perfect. He, what you see here is a visualization of, uh, of a, the simulated number of stories used in the National Structure Inventory. That's the, the kind of the bluish purple pillars going up and the actual you know, Google Earth. And you can see it does pretty well. Imagine you have a flood area um, and it's flooding eight feet or actually 10 feet. Does it make a difference if every, if every structure is one story or two story? Huge difference, right? It's the difference between me being completely submerged in my home versus me just going upstairs. So number of stories is hugely imp important. It's good, it's not perfect. Um, you still need to review it. All right, improvements in the population assignment. Like I said, we're using the LEHD data set, which really helps in, in identifying where people are during the day, which census blocks they're working in, and, and where they live at night. Some of the other data sources, so nighttime residential population, census 2010 was, or census was decided as the best data set. Currently it's using 2010 because that was the latest available when the NSI 2.0 came out. However, it's, it's getting uh, updates reasonably frequently, and as those updates come out, as new census data is released, they'll be incorporated into the data set. Dynamics. I, I think I said it right first time. Longitudinal employer household dynamics. It's the working population. Has this for um, enrolled students by, by census block. And then uh, the National Center for Education Statistics for uh, some more student population, student teacher counts. I'm sure you're all chomping at the bit to understand what the heck LEHD data is and how it works in the population distribution. I know I would be. So here's how it works. You got a census block, um, let's say in this case, it's the grayed out one, and you know where these, where population is going from this individual census block, which census blocks they're going to, but also which, which people are going to this target census block uh, to work. So it gives, so what we do is we take that information and we estimate pools of population for each census block, okay? And that pools of population means how many students do I have in this census block? How many working people do I have during the day in the census block? How many people do I have that are residential in the census block? Once we have those pools, we can distribute that population to the structures. Here's an example of how that works. So in this case, we have our, our census data starts with our nighttime residential population, right? And so those are all residential. We look at our origin destination information. Loads comes from LEHD. And we say, okay, two of those people leave this census block during the day, and one of them remains. They actually work in the same census block that they live. They get distributed to the industrial and commercial facilities, the, the structures within the census block. And then we know that there's others coming into the census block from outside. That's the beauty of that data set. So we can take that pool of working population and associate it with those structures that would have working people. Um, of those residential, you know what? Two of them are um, two of them are going to school. So we identify those and defend, identify which schools they go to. They get distributed outside of the census block and also inside. Okay, so this is the this is the concept of how population population gets distributed within the, within the national structure inventory. It's pretty cool. It's pretty complicated, but at the same time, it's intuitive. Um, how do you then distribute among multiple structures? So if you have five residential structures and you say there's 100 residential people, how do you distribute to those structures? And, and they, we do that through a weighting system. So it, depending on the types of structures, if it's a multifamily versus a single family, they're gonna, the multifamily is gonna get the lion's share of residential population. All right, so improvements on the structure uh, gave us, um, the structure value improvements were dependent on the uh, structure square footage. So we we're able to improve the structure value estimates beyond what was there re previously by in integrating the structural square footage into that assessment. There's fewer generics in that case. Better estimate of ba basement status, which can be very important um, when you're doing a damage assessment, if there's a basement or not, and also if you're doing a life loss assessment. Uh, index price levels depreciation of those values. Improvements from firm flood map zones. So we've implemented the firm map flood zones because that gives you a better information on, you know what, if they're in the V zone, they're more likely to have a pier and pile type foundations. And pier and pile type foundations are going to push them up higher and give a very different foundation height and a different stability criteria. 
So future enhancements, that's the NSI in a nutshell. I went through it pretty quickly, but uh, this is a pretty quick one. Future enhancements are going to be um, trip chaining. I'm really excited about this one um, because the idea is since we have this information about where people start, where they go to work during the day, when you think about how people evacuate from, like if I'm at work and I hear Lake Berryess has failed, which is a dam near Davis, kind of, and I know that it's gonna be about eight, eight hours before water arrives, Am I going to just leave right away or am I going to go home and get my family first and then evacuate out? I assume most of you would go home first and get your family, get your things and then evacuate out as opposed to just ditching your family and saying good luck, you know? So this idea of trip chaining is really important during the evacuation because then you can run into a situation where people are in the potential inundated area much longer because they're going, in, going to their home, they're gathering their things before they actually try to evacuate out. Um, and that's, a, that's an important piece of the modeling that we want to implement in the future. All right, um, other future improvements to the National Structure Inventory. So the good news, um, like was mentioned earlier, is that, well, the bad news is that currently it's not available to the public. But the good news is that within a year, hopefully, it will be. A new version will come out that has even more improvements that will be available to anyone who wants it. Um, and that's great. So you can just, you can just submit your polygon uh, area, kind of like, has anyone used National Map Viewer, USGS as National Map Viewer? You go in, you define your area and say, what's all the data in there? Give me that. You can do that with this. Part of this, um, part of the, uh, the concept for the National Structure Inventory is you can download a structure inventory look at it, review it, make improvements, make improvements on where the structures are located, on population, number of stories, improve it, review it, then you can submit it back and then it'll be available for anyone. So then the next person comes along, they draw their polygon, they say, I want structure inventory in here. Well, we have our base one, but we also have this improved one from person A. So that's gonna be a really nice feature in the future. Um, and then those, those inventories will be made available. And so hopefully it'll avoid duplicative efforts in the future. This is my favorite part, common errors. I talked about how great the NSI is. I talked about all these amazing things, LEHD data, point on structure. It's perfect, right? No, it is not perfect. If you ever download the structure inventory, do a consequence assessment and submit those results, then you have made a grievous error in that you didn't review the structure inventory and make adjustments because there, there's always issues. There's always issues with all the attributes. And so I'm gonna go over some of those common issues. This first one I like a lot um, because there's nothing wrong with the structure inventory. As you can see from the picture, those structures are placed perfectly. They're right on, right on the structure where they are in real life, right? But the problem is the hydraulic data is really, really bad quality. The, the cell sizes on the, the hydraulic output are really big. So you can see the, those big rectangles are actually representing a channel that goes right next, to this, uh, right next to this neighborhood. And so the depths from that channel are getting, it, getting put out onto those structures because of the poor quality of the hydraulic data. So what do you do? What, what, does anyone have a suggestion on what you would do in this situation? So one, you could say hydraulic modeler, this is way too coarse. I need finer detail on my hydraulics. That's not really gonna work because, uh, well, it might work, but it's gonna be really expensive and it's gonna create hydraulic files that are billions of gigabytes. And so maybe that's not the best solution. Maybe the best solution is just to simply move those structures out of the way, put them where they're not supposed to be in real life because they're, now they're gonna receive depths that are relative to the overbank area, not depths relative to the channel. So this is a quick and easy fix that gets you the result that's reasonable without going through the effort of having to redo your hydraulic modeling. All right, another one, structures distributed incorrectly. Like I said, structure placement isn't always right. Sometimes structures are placed in the middle of nowhere and it doesn't make any sense. So you gotta look at those, make sure they make sense and place them appropriately, especially if they're in the way of the flood wave. In this case, the, these two structures with a bunch of people in them were inappropriately placed in the way of the flood wave. And when they were placed correctly, they were, then they were then outside the flood wave, which drastically reduced the consequences. So structure placement is huge. Population distributed incorrectly. This is something that you'll see quite a bit if you look at the National Structure Inventory. Here we have a single family residential home with a thousand people in it during the day. It's a, it's a big house. It's a big family. 
Um, obviously, it's incorrect. I think in this situation, this structure just happened to be next to a census block that had an apartment complex in it, and the population from the apartment complex got spilled over into the other census block. So bad news bears. And think about this, when we were talking about occupancy types, we were talking about how people evacuate away. Now you're going to have a thousand people evacuating as a single giant group through your, through your inundated area because, that, because that's how uh, single family residentials are defined, right? Is everyone receives a warning at the same time and they all mobilize together. So something to look out for. Um, the type of structure matters and the number of people in it matter. Next one. Um, this is one where I said, hey, single family residential, look at mm, aerial imagery doesn't really line up. Do some street view. I don't see any homes there. Do you guys see any homes? Yeah, so definitely a problem there. So that's an issue. One with population distribution, because I doubt there's a bunch of people here during the day, maybe a couple people in these, in these outbuildings. Um, and two is there's no single family residential. So you definitely want to change the occupancy type on those structures and maybe change the population as well. But be aware that population probably needs to go somewhere. You need to redistribute it most likely. Don't just delete it from your inventory. Last one, foundation heights. So here we have a res two is a manufactured home with a four foot foundation height. Doesn't seem that unreasonable. Go in street view, there's that manufactured home. Foundation height does not look like it's four feet, looks slab on grade make the adjustment, all of a sudden your damages and your potential life loss at that structure can skyrocket because they no longer have that four foot buffer that they could go vertical evacuation on. So all things to look out for, for structure inventory. I know that was quick and dirty. I just wanted to cover a pretty broad spectrum. Hopefully you all got something good out of it.